Well, I've been in the space long enough to watch the top 10 on coin market cap change a lot. Mm. Uh, I remember Feathercoin and Purecoin and Freycoin and Namecoin and these things. Uh, so stuff changes. The only constant is change. So, you know, who, who knows if it's Polkadot, Ethereum and Cardano. It does look like we're heading to a Mexican standoff and, you know, it's going to be a good, the bad, the ugly type of a deal. And we don't know which one's wearing a poncho. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll find out what happens and the market will decide that. But I think we have the wrong mentality when we look at things in a sum zero way. At the end of the day, we have to say, are we solving the problems we set out to solve? And there's two sets of them. One are conceptual and then the other problems are actual. So the conceptual problems are convincing people that you can run governance, you can run systems in a fundamentally different way. Money is a great example of that. We say, oh, okay, two options. You can have private money or public money. So either have a central bank that a government controls or a bank issues a currency. Both of these have screwed the pooch. There's been over 100 plus years of history in central, modern central banking and in private banking, we've seen all the way back to the Rothschilds and their gold certificates. In all cases, they just don't work out well. Last year, we printed $6 trillion of money out of thin air to pay for stuff. And they have the audacity to say, I still have to pay taxes. Why? If you're telling me you can print $6 trillion and it's not going to have inflation, why don't you just do that every year and pay for everything? Why not just you know, helicopter money and monetary theory? See, that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the logical inconsistency and the temptation of the printing press. And in private money, look at Tether or these other things. There's a lot of allegations flowing around that maybe they're a fractional reserve. And even if they're not, it's real tempting to be a private business and sit on $25 billion of cash and be like, well, nobody will really know if I take a little bit and maybe invest it in this or do it in that or something like this. What the Rothschilds did with their gold certificates. They say, hey, people aren't uh, redeeming these at the rate of issuance. So we could go fractional. Nobody would even notice and look how much money we'd make from that seniorage. Okay. So when you have those types of situations occur, maybe it's better to have a third option and that's what bitcoin basically did it said this is a deflationary money system value systems like a proto commodity it's like digital gold that allows you to build money and it, it's not run by a government it's not run by a bank it's something new and i'll keep saying it maybe one day it'll happen we live in two worlds we live in the developed world and the developing world and the developing world they're unbanked for the most part and despite the fact that they're just as smart as us they work harder than we do and they're just as human as you and me, they are shafted because their systems are terrible. They live in capital controls and corrupt governments, and they live in areas where there's not good rule of law, and they don't have stable currencies, and as a consequence, no real good banking infrastructure, no good risk management infrastructure, and so forth. So they can't build wealth of no fault of their own. They lost a geographic lottery. They were just unlucky. Okay, so the point of our technology is to take a step back and say, why don't we just give them a new system? We talk about DeFi. Who's going to be using DeFi? The 25-year-old yield farming kid in New Jersey living in his mom and dad's basement? Or is it going to be the farmer in Ethiopia that's trying to get a fertilizer voucher and can actually, if he gets it, afford to repay you a 15% interest rate? It's going to be the farmer. You see, and that's that's what gets me up in the morning. And I don't really care if that infrastructure runs on Polkadot or Ethereum or Bitcoin. The reason I built Cardano was that I looked at all the infrastructures. I looked at their roadmap and I realized they're trying to chase the wrong markets. They're dealing in the wrong ponds and they're not going to really proactively go to that part of the world and help them out. So if we built Cardano the right way, it would be built in a way that would be maximally beneficial to as many people as possible. So yes, the IBMs can use us and the Microsofts can use us and the GMs can use us and we can do supply chain and you know all of these other things. Sure, but that's not the point. What I'm gonna do is wake up and direct our commercial efforts, my company's commercial efforts to Ethiopia and to the country of Georgia and to Southeast Asia and to Mongolia, but it's an open protocol. So as we do that, everybody else gets to use the protocol for their own use and utility. And what's so cool is you can have a merging of two worlds. So they say, well, it creates use and adoption. Would you like 10 million new customers who are under the age of 30, who are highly digitized, with rapidly growing income, who have no brand preferences? Well, of course. So, okay, come on board, build applications for that and so forth. So this is the beautiful thing where we each get to 
touch the elephant in a different way and maybe somebody gets the tail and somebody gets the tusk uh, i i am looking at it from one particular mission and viewpoint but to solve that i've abstracted it and built a generic framework and i believe what we've constructed can satisfy the demands of billions of people and as a consequence i also believe what we've built will in the long term be the most competitive platform for all of these use cases because you know what whether you build a fair election system in senegal or you build a fair election system in america it's the same problem and if i can make it work for some of the poorest people in the world and bring them a better election system than the one we have in the united states why don't we go to the us with it after we've demonstrated that it works there don i don't think too much about the day to day of polka dot versus ethereum versus this cuz you know it used to be eos and tezos and flip the page it's going to be avalanche and f2 next year and then it'll be something else it'll be bobcoin you know and okay what really matters is do you have laser focus on the vision the market and the problems you want to solve and are you willing to take the risk to be there that you tend to invent the safety belt after you invent the car and you don't just proactively say hey it's a good idea to put a safety belt and what happens is you get in a car accident you go through the windshield and you're like boy we should do something about that uh so ethereum and bitcoin were much smaller systems in a much smaller economy when they came out so there was no value at risk we raised 18 million dollars for ethereum we were like wow if we can get to a 100 million dollar cryptocurrency and get you know a few thousand people building cool stuff it's successful huzzah and now it's a 130 billion dollar ecosystem so there's a fundamental difference between where it began to where it's at and similarly when you build the car or the first airplane you're not thinking at all about safety you're not thinking at all about these success factors that come the consequences of success that come well if you build a car today you don't have the ability to just pretend like history doesn't exist so you have to do things differently So the Teslas for example they had to adhere to all the safety standards of Ford and GM and these other things while also innovating and bringing new things to market. So we recognized very early on that there were a lot of issues with consensus design especially if you plan on scaling uh with proof of work in in the way that Bitcoin and Ethereum were using it. So we needed a fundamentally different way of doing consensus and even Vitalik agrees with that which is why F2 exists and they're trying to clean this stuff up. But we went beyond that and said the entire development paradigm of how people build dapps, they write smart contracts, this type of stuff, it has to be rethought from a very first principles basis because it was never built in a way for sustainability it was never built in a way for resource predictability because if i'm an application builder i'd like to have predictable application costs could you imagine a web host who's like well maybe i'll charge you $500 today for your app and then tomorrow maybe it'll be $5000 and then the next day it'll be $5 here it's like what kind of drugs are you on this is not a business i i need to have predictable costs if i'm going to be able to have a predictable application or else nothing works Well, Ethereum was never built for that. It was built as an experiment that kind of grew into a successful project and now they're trying to build a safer car. And this is why first mover advantage in technology in many cases is actually a historic disadvantage. The first web browser was Mosaic and it was a, you know, for its time revolutionary, but really didn't do much in the long stream of things. Even Netscape failed and even Internet Explorer failed and now we're in the Chrome age and maybe brave will dethrone them who knows well similarly search engines like google i think was the 17th search engine to be commercialized you know it was it so there was a lot of failures before google there was a monopoly before google. yahoo had a huge chunk of the market and they were very powerful myspace had a huge chunk of the market before facebook came and now facebook is starting to deal with all these emergent hellions that are new social networks that are scraping away at it so uh, usually what happens when you're the first mover is you get a lot of population but it's unstable and they're very frustrated with that platform and you're covered with lots of scars and legacy design decisions and other such things and as a consequence you you can't it's like holding sand in your hand it slips through your fingers and it's really really hard to keep your lead and then all these other competitors come and they have the benefit of hindsight so they don't make the same mistakes you've made and they also know where they need to innovate and because they don't have to deal with the legacy concerns you have they can move faster than you and as a consequence they get more features and come to market before so for example ethereum had been working on proof of stake a year longer than we had with casper despite that we were first to market with our proof of stake protocol and they probably won't have theirs fully turned on until 
2022. And that's just completely a consequence of process and scale and dealing with uh, their legacy concerns. 